Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Chapter 11 of my Fire Emblem 6 Hard Mode 0% Girls playthrough. We are your hosts, Don Donovan 1 and Mecca. Hi. So this chapter is very long. Um, it's almost as long as Chapter 8, but in contrast with Chapter 8, it is also a lot more entertaining because there are many more things to do. Uh, so I think a lot of players have a bit of a love-hate relationship with this chapter because um, it's very complex. There are a lot of side objectives, uh, including visiting a lot of um, houses for items and also recruiting uh, up to three potential recruitable units. So um, there are many things that we have to do uh, strategy-wise, and I hope you enjoy it. One of the more enjoyable new characters that we get is Lalam, who is already with us. She just refreshed Zilok. And Lalam is a very special unit because instead of fighting herself, she lets other units get another turn. And this not only extends their movement range, but it also lets them perform another action. So this is rescuing, dropping, attacking, you name it. Which is very flexible. Unfortunately, Lalam is very fragile. So when she's exposed to enemies, she won't counterattack and she probably will die because she has very low HP and defenses. So you need to be very careful about using her. This is why she's... Well, she's high risk, high reward in a way. Basically, the smarter you are as a player, the more use you get out of Lalam. And Lalam is a very smart man, so we will get lot of, lots of use out of her. And Lalam is also the reason that we call this chapter uh, 11L, because uh, Lalam is route specific. Um, she has a counterpart character who does the exact same thing as she does, named Elfin. And if you go the other route, you get Elfin instead of Lalam. But uh, story-wise, both of them join you. But as a unit, a playable character, this is the route where you get Lalam. Yeah, too bad we can't get um, both Lalam and Elfin as playable characters. That would be pretty broken, having uh, two refresher units. Elfin's not a dancer, he's a bard, but I mean, as Mecha said, they do the same thing. Um, and, you know, there's obviously a reason why uh, in none of the Fire Emblem games you get two dancers, because uh, that would be pretty overpowered, because the dancers would just be able to dance each other and then just walk across like the entire map and do whatever the heck they want. Um, like, I think even in the games where uh, you have a unit who can completely imitate the functions of another unit, uh, the only unit that they can't imitate or that they, they can't completely replicate is like a dancer. Because uh, in that case, they already figured out that, you know, being able to imitate a dancer will be too broken. Um, I can go on and on about the uh, virtues of dancer units. Um, I won't because uh, we have limited time despite having almost 60 minutes in this chapter. Uh, but anyway, I want to briefly cover the general strategy that I'm using in this map. So, you might have noticed that we've sent pretty much uh, our Brigade of Paladins down south, um, along with Clarine, Astor, and Lalam. So the reason why we sent the Paladins down south with Lalam is because um, one of the major drawbacks of Dancer units is that they are often uh, unmounted, and they only have like 5 movement, which is tied with, um, some, which is tied with unpromoted infantry, uh, except for knights, but that's inside. So one way to uh, augment their movement range is basically just to continuously rescue drop them um, as they help mounted units move on ahead. So that's pretty much what we're going to be doing with Lalam here in this map. Uh, and the reason why we're bringing Clarine down south is because there's a recruitable unit that comes in at the uh, bottom right hand corner of the map and Clarine is the only unit who can talk to him to recruit him onto our side. You can see that the middle part of this map is surrounded by a lot of walls and only Shanna can cross them right now and she did some shopping but she's flying right back. And to get the other units there, and there's two ways we could go about it. One way that we're actually going to do is break through a 100 HP wall. And that's why we brought Geese along to use his Brave Axe and break down that wall. Which is still going to take a long time because he does 20 per hit. But you gotta wonder why you're not just using uh, Shanna to airlift someone like Rutger over the wall and take care of the enemies. Well, for one, there's just a ton of enemies, and even though we know that Rucker has no problem cutting uh, big swaths through tons of enemy units, um, the ones in this chapter pose a bit of a problem because, uh, first of all, he has a lot of trouble dealing with archers um, because the only way he can counter them is with Light Brand, and we're running pretty low on the number of uses on our Light Brand right now, um, so we don't want to do that. And the other reason is because um, he doesn't get any sort of like weapon triangle advantage against archers, so. He'd have a pretty, he'd face pretty high risk of getting hit, and uh, without a good way to heal him, I mean we could physic him from across the wall, but it ends up actually just being much easier for us to pincer attack most of the enemy formation uh, from the south and from the north, because it splits up the enemies that way, and we can deal with piecemeal as opposed to just throwing Rucker at all of them at one time. 
Yeah, you'll see later that we actually have a bit more time to take care of the enemies than you might think. Uh, there's some urgent objectives in this chapter, but right now none of them apply. And this is why it's fine that our paladins are actually much worse than they have been in the past. Uh, you might remember Marcus in chapter 1, he was the only one doing anything reasonable to these enemies. He was almost one round KOing with his Iron Sword. And right now there was actually an instance where we needed all three of our paladins to take down one fighter. Yeah, while at the same time Astor showed them how it's done and one round KO'd them with, uh, one of them with a killing edge critical. Uh, so big props to Astor, who at this moment is going to instead switch to an Iron Sword and just merely tickle an archer for a little bit of damage. Um, but the fighters on this map come in three flavors. Uh, there are the ones with Steel Axes. Those guys are weighed down a lot, so uh, they're easily doubled by our Paladins. Um, the drawback is that uh, they hit really hard if they hit at all. So even though we can manipulate um, Weapon Triangle advantage against them to reduce their hit rate down to uh, kind of negligible percentages, um, we do have to worry that uh, if one of our Paladins do get hit, they end up taking a ton of damage, and I think um, the weaker ones like Noah and Marcus might even get too big KO'd by them. Uh, some of the other fighters have hand axes. Uh, these guys are not weighed down as much. They're very inaccurate. Um, their drawback is that they're a bit difficult to kill because it's very hard to counter them in enemy phase because we don't have ranged swords with a triangle advantage. And the third flavor of fighter are ones with iron axes. These guys are arguably the most dangerous because um, they're not weighed down, uh, they're more accurate than the guys with steel axes, and they still do a fair chunk of damage with their hit. Yeah, you might have noticed that uh, uh, we kind of stopped our advance in the, in the south of the map. This is because the recruitable character that Clarine is going to recruit is going to show up there. And we want to make sure that Clarine can just uh, safely recruit him the turn he joins the map. So that's why we're kind of stalling there. Uh, so I want to point out something about the um, recruitable units that appear on this map. Two of them are going to appear on the map as enemies. And uh, there's one very specific thing that you sort of need to know about them that you might not know if you play through this game normally. Um, some players have had the very aggravating experience of having these recruitable enemies appear on the map and then not move. Um, and so the reason why this happens is because uh, in this game, before any enemy unit makes a move, the game uses at least one random number to basically determine like how they move. Um, but for these recruitable enemies, and for uh, I think at least one more recruitable enemy later on uh, in the game, this random number also determines whether or not they move at all. Now I have no idea why the game developers decided to like include this little gimmick, um, because it makes recruiting these guys a lot more luck-based and frustrating. Um, they have about a 10% chance to not move at all, and if they don't move, then uh, they're not standing within range of our player unit that we need to talk to them. So I don't know why they did that. Yeah, this is really random. Um, while there's almost nothing happening besides chipping away at these enemies, we should probably note uh, there's a ton of villages around this map, as we've already kind of mentioned. And they're kind of annoying to visit for a couple of reasons. First off, they're very spread out. And second off, we want to save them all because it gives them gives you a reward, so it's very annoying if you miss them. And there's another reason why they're very annoying to visit, isn't there? Yeah, uh, if you've played a game like um, uh, Fire Emblem 9 or Fire Emblem 10, uh, those have, you know, like more detailed maps. So in order to visit a house there, you just need to stand in front of the door and then you can move away. Here you actually have to like, kind of move into the house and then move back out, so it costs a total of extra two movement to visit the houses. And uh, that's sort of annoying because even though we have a lot of mountain units, most of them are fighting on this map. And the only one who's been visiting villages so far really is Trek, and he decided to join the fray too for a brief chip on the spider. Uh, but because there are so many houses to visit here, uh, you know, the extra two movement that you have to expend to go in and out of a house, it actually adds up a bit over time. So here we have the first recruitment. Uh, Klein just joined our army and all of his friends turned into NPCs and they will be attempt to flee the map, uh, thankfully. If you're a bit of a slower player, there might still be enemies left that will try to um, kill these archers because they can't counter and they have weak stats, but thankfully we've cleared almost all of them, so this is not going to be a problem. And Klein is a pretty decent unit, right? Yeah, I think Klein is... Uh, in general, I would consider him to be pretty good. Um, he's a pre unit, uh, and we haven't had very many of those by this point in the game. Um, Stat-wise, he has uh, a pretty high base strength. He has 16 base strength, uh, so he deals pretty decent damage to whatever he hits. And his base speed is also not that bad. Um, I mean, it's kind of on the slow side in comparison to a unit like Rutger, 
but he's tied in base speed with uh, Zealot and he's faster than Marcus from Noah. So he does double a fair amount of enemies at this point in the game. And so in combination with his um, uh, very excellent base bow rank, actually he starts with a base A in bows, which means he can use the very strong silver bow that he comes with. Uh, he's kind of like a reliable unit in some circumstances, but because he's not mounted, uh, and he can't, you know, move again after rescuing someone or anything like that, um, we're not going to see too much of that's unfortunate, but Klein does need to recruit another unit on this chapter all the way in the north, so we're gonna get him up there as soon as we can. But first up, we have some brigand reinforcements to deal with. And those are very frustrating for newer players who just got here and still have a bunch of other enemies to take care of because they threaten to burn down all these villages, and if they burn out even one, you don't get all the rewards that you want. Right, so uh, there is a reward for visiting all the villages in this chapter and not letting any of them burn down, and that's a hero crest uh, that you get at the end, kind of like as thanks. You have to wonder plot-wise how that makes sense, because these guys are supposed to be very poor, so not only do they give you like all their possessions, but then if you save all of them, they give you even more of their possessions. It doesn't really make any sense. But um, in the Fire Emblem series, uh, brigands are one enemy type that classically are able to um, I, I wouldn't call them visit villages, but they're able to go into them and then burn them down so that you don't get the reward. Uh, in this chapter, um, if you're playing a bit slower and they appear on the map and you're nowhere near a village, it's not time to fret yet because um, these guys prioritize attacking player units over burning down villages, so you just have to like park a unit within their attack range and they'll get immediately sidetracked. Yeah, or you can just be like Saul and just smite them because you are obsessed with righteousness. Um, Tate just flew in with uh, the rest of her squad, and Klein has been dropped just into her range so he can recruit her. And Tate is like Shanna, but at a higher level, I guess, with hard mode bonuses. Um, there's not much to say about her, I guess, besides the fact that she's a flyer that can promote, right? I think Tate is like the number one reason why so many players are frustrated with this map, uh, because to recruit her, you have to basically take a unit that you recruited at the entire opposite end of the map and then go to um, where you think she's going to fly. So, because she's a flyer, she can like get stuck, she can like fly behind walls and then it's very hard to like talk to her because Klein's uh, locked to the ground. Um, the other reason why she's really frustrating is because uh, you can recruit her with Klein, but you can also talk to her with Shanna to turn her into an NPC. This will also turn her allies into NPCs, but they become aggressive NPCs. So, you do get a reward at the end of this chapter um, if you have all of Klein's NPCs alive, uh, and if you, a separate reward if you have all of Tate's NPCs alive. Um, the problem with Tate's NPCs is that if they become aggressive, uh, they're all very weak, so they will want to swarm enemy units and attack them, and they might get one round KO, uh, they might just get annihilated on the counter attack, and that will just deprive you of the reward at the end of the chapter. So, the only solution about this, um, aside from killing all the enemies beforehand, is to recruit her as early as possible with the client, and just don't really bother talking to her with Shanna, because it might cause more trouble than it saves. Speaking of weak, uh, we see Noah here, he did like 8 damage to this warrior enemy. It's kind of unfair that he has to use an iron sword here. Yeah, but he's stuck with it because um, in arenas in this game, uh, you use the most basic weapon in the type that you're the most proficient in. So Noah's the most proficient in swords, therefore he always goes into the arena with an iron sword. Um, here we just have an NPC that appeared. Uh, this NPC is the reason why we're taking so long on this map, because she is the last recruitable unit to appear on this map. And she also appears in a bit of an unfair situation. Uh, she gets smoked out by three enemy fighters. And so her name is Kidna, she's a hero, which means she can use axes and swords. Now for some reason, developers gave her a steel axe to combat all these enemy fighters with axes instead of sword. Um, so if you're not very prepared for her entrance, uh, first of all, it's very possible that she might just get instantly killed the moment that she appears and you have no way to talk to her. Um, the other uh, thing that you have to watch out for is um, you have to talk to her with Lalum to recruit her, and because she's defenseless, you also have to wall off the enemy fighters with some of your player units just to make, their, make sure that Lalum doesn't get attacked and possibly kill. Yes, yeah, so all we have left to do now besides recruit a Kidna and maybe kill some enemies is the boss, and I understand that you're feeding the boss kill to Tate. Right, because we want to get Tate to promotion as soon as possible, she joins level 8, uh, and so the easiest way to do that is to basically do the same thing that we did with Saul two chapters earlier, which is to feed 
per the boss kill. Um, but this boss is a bit weaker than the chapter 9 boss, so uh, we can't just have Rucker charge in and um, destroy him with double critical. We actually need him to restrain himself and only get one critical and hit with the, get a normal hit with the other uh, attack. And that allows us to weaken the boss further with Shin and put him in KO range for Tate with the Slim Lance. Uh, so that gives her enough EXP to um, basically be around 43 experience short of level 10, which means that with a bit of uh, favoritism in the following chapter, she is able to reach level 10 and promote for uh, this chapter after that. So after completing this chapter, uh, we get our Hero's Quest for saving all the villages, our Orion's Boat for saving all the client's NPCs, and our Elysian Whip for saving all of Tate's NPCs. That's chapter 11, completed in 9 turns. We will see you next time. Bye.